Hi, good evening. My name is David Bloom. I'm a social studies teacher here at Michigan High School. Welcome to the fifth annual Evening of History. Our program tonight is a commemoration of the year 1957, school year 2017, 2018, with the 1950s as a larger theme. Through historical speech and song, our goal is to educate, to acknowledge, to inspire, to reflect, and most of all, to tell a story of a time and place. Many thanks to the students, faculty, and staff who you will see here and hear this evening. I'd like to personally acknowledge the work of Mr. Brian O'Connor, the advisor and driving force of the Broadcast Club and the co-creator of the wonderful video. Give a hand for the video. The trio of great men from the music department, Mr. Eric Hughes, Mr. Phil Pandori, and the birthday boy himself, Mr. Dave Fisk. <laughs> Mrs. Maria Germain, Mr. Tim Jeffries, and Ms. Heather Workman. Special, <laughs> special thanks for me to my co-creator, collaborator, partner in crime, Bonnie, Clyde, and everyone to look at us, the amazing, absolutely irreplaceable, Mrs. Christina Catalano. <laughs> Looking back, is there any decade more stereotyped in history, especially by Americans, than the 1950s? Wedged between the bitter cold peace and the new threat of nuclear annihilation in the 1940s, and the white-hot, tie-dyed color explosion of the 1960s, the late great journalist David Howard Stamm wrote in his sweeping history of the period, quote, in retrospect, the pace of the 50s seemed slow, almost languid. The 50s appear to be an orderly era, one with a minimum of social dissent. In the years following the traumatic experiences of the Depression and World War II, the American dream was to exercise personal freedom, not in social or political terms, but rather in economic ones. In the selections presented tonight, you will hear from a variety of sources that both reinforce and challenge this picture. For as Halberstam also reminds us, quote, social ferment was beginning under this placid surface. If we use 1957 as our jumping off point, we should picture the statistical height of the baby boom in the United States, the debut of the Frisbee toys, the television shows I Love Lucy and American Bandstand, and the signing of the stabilizing European Economic Community Treaty, really signaling that Europe was, it was in a, a good phase of rebuilding after the war. Also, however, in 1957, the United States president sent the army into Little Rock, Arkansas, to defend a court order outlawing segregation in public schools. The conflict between North and South Vietnam began to heat up. The people of Hungary rose up to defy and challenge the rule of the Soviet Union and Ghana became independent from Great Britain. So who or what really reflects the 1950s? Is there a real 1950s? The novel is The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit or Catcher in the Rye? The dominance of the superpowers or the challenges of the revolutionaries? Vice President Richard Nixon or Senator John F. Kennedy? Artist Norman Rockwell or Jackson Pollock? Musicians Bing Crosby or Elvis Presley? Tonight we tell our version of the story and we leave the conclusions up to you guys. Part one, poetry. The publication of Howe in 1956 and On the Road in 1957 introduced the world to the Beats, a group of writers, provocateurs, who challenged the accepted forms of poetry and novels, respectively. Despite diverse family backgrounds and upbringings, all five writers in this section shared a commitment to deeply delve into their inner lives and touch on universal themes of love, loss, and longing. Howl by Allen Ginsberg. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the streets at dawn looking for an angry fix, angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo and the machinery of night who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness, cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz. 
who bared their brains to heaven and under the L and saw Mohammedan angels staggering on tenement roofs illuminated. Who passed through universities with radiant, cool eyes hallucinating Arkansas and Blake Lake tragedy among the scholars of war. Who were expelled from the academies for crazy and publishing obscene odes on the windows of the skull. Who cowered in unshaven rooms and underwear, burning their money in waste baskets and listening to the terror through the wall. Who talked continuously 70 hours from park to pad to bar to Bellevue to museum to the Brooklyn Bridge. A lost battalion of platonic conversationalists jumping down the stoops off fire escapes, off windowsills, off Empire State, out of the moon, yakety yakking, screaming, vomiting, whispering facts and memories and anecdotes and eyeball kicks and shocks of hospitals and jails and wars. Whole intellects disgorged in total recall for seven days and nights with brilliant eyes meet for the synagogue cast on the pavement who vanished into nowhere, Zen, New Jersey, leaving a trail of ambiguous picture postcards of Atlantic City Hall, suffering eastern sweats and Tangerian bone grindings and migraines of China under jump withdrawal in Newark's bleak furnished room, who wandered around and around at midnight in the railroad yard, wondering where to go and when, leaving no broken hearts, who let cigarettes in boxcars, 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 racketing through the snow toward lonesome farms and grandfather night, who studied Plotinus Poe St. John of the Cross, telepathy, and Bob Kava Ba. Because the cosmos instinctively vibrated at their feet in Kansas. Man and Wife by Robert Lowell. Tamed by Milktown, we lie on Mother's bed. The rising sun and more paint dyes us red. In broad daylight, her gilded bedposts shine, abandoned, almost Dionysian. At last, the trees are green on Mar Marlboro Street. Blossoms on her magnolia ignite the morning with their murderous five days white. All night, I've held your hand, as if you had a fourth time faced the kingdom of the mad, its hackneyed speech, its homicidal eye, and dragged me home alive. Oh, my petite, clearest of all God's creatures, still all air and nerve. You were in your twenties, and I, once hand in glass and heart in mouth, out drank the robs in the heat of Greenwich Village, fainting at your feet. Too boiled and shy and poker faced to make a pass, while the shrill verb here infected scorched the traditional South. Now, twelve years later, you turn your back. Sleepless, you hold your pillow to your hollows like a child. Your old fashioned tirade, loving, rapid, merciless, breaks like the Atlantic Ocean in my hand. Show you the stars. Life at first. 
is 12.20 in New York, a Friday, three days after Bastille Day. Yes, it is 1959, and I'll go get a shoe shine, because I will get off at the 419 in East Hampton at 7.15, and then go straight to dinner, and I don't know the people who will feed me. I walk up the muggy street beginning the sun, and have a hamburger, and a malted, and buy an ugly New World writing to see what the poets in Ghana are doing these days. I go on to the bank and Miss Stillwagon, first name Linda I once heard, doesn't even look up my balance for once in her life. And in the Golden Griffin, I get a little Verlaine for Patsy with drawings by Bonner, although I do think of Hesiod. Richard Lattimore or Brendan Behan's new play or La Balcon or La Negresse of Gannett, but I don't. I stick with Verlaine after practically going to sleep with Quandriness. And for Mike, I just stroll into the Park Lane liquor store and ask for a bottle of Strega. And then I go back where I came from to 6th Avenue and the Tobacco Nest and the Sigrid Theater and casually ask for a carton of Galoises and a carton of Picayunes and a New York Post with her face on it. And I'm sweating a lot by now and thinking of leaning on the John door in the five spot while she whispered a song along the keyboard to Ma Waldron and to everyone, and I stopped breathing. On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Great Chicago glowed red before our eyes. We were suddenly on Madison Street, among hordes of hobos, some of them sprawled out on the street with their feet up on the curb, hundreds of others milling in the doorways of saloons and alleys. Whoop, whoop. Look sharp for old Dean Moriarty there. He may be in Chicago by accident this year. We let out the hobos on the street and proceeded to downtown Chicago. Screeching trolleys, newsboys, Gals cutting by, the smell of fried food and beer in the air, neons winking. We're in the big town, Sal. Woo wee. First thing to do was park the Cadillac in a good, dark spot and wash up and dress for the night. Across the street from the YMCA, we found a red brick alley between buildings and ready to go, then followed the college boys up to the Y where they got a room and allowed us to use their facilities for an hour. Where are we going, man? I don't know, but we gotta go. Then, here came a gang of young bop musicians carrying their instruments out of cars. They piled right into a saloon, and we followed them. They set themselves up and started blowing. There we were. Stranger flowers yet, for as the Negro alto mused over everyone's head with dignity, the young, tall, slender blonde kid from Curtis Street, Denver, jeans and studded belt, sucked on his mouthpiece while waiting for others to finish. And when they did, he started. And you had to look around to see where the solo was coming from. For it came with angelic smiling lips upon the mouthpiece. It was a soft, sweet, fairy tale solo on an alto. Lonely as America, a throat piece sat. Here's the sound in the night. Part two, musicals. Often considered as part of the golden age of musical theater, the shows presented here represent a large part of the cultural landscape of the 1950s. According to fashion historian Kimberly Christman Campbell, Cinderella, released in 1950, was an instant classic. Had it flopped, quote, Walt Disney would likely have gone out of business. Instead, it was a huge hit, and in 1955, he opened Disneyland. More on that later, actually. Peter Pan opens on Broadway in 1950. West Side Story had a respectable run of 732 Broadway performances and was made into a very successful movie. The Music Man ran nearly twice as long with 1,375 performances. Enjoy this musical interlude, and I'd like to just ask if we could please hold your applause until the end of each medley. Thanks.